This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. It's been a few years since we've talked about Neanderthals on the show, and there have been so many fascinating discoveries about them since then. I thought it was time for another look. Neanderthals lived for hundreds of thousands of years across a wide swath of the world, from what's now Israel to what's now England, and they adapted to live in all kinds of environments and through multiple dramatic periods of intense climate change. Early prehistorians had little more than stones and bones to work with as they tried to piece together the story of the Neanderthals. But today's researchers work in ways those early prehistorians could never have imagined. Increasingly advanced technology and methods like ancient DNA research, proteomics, and 3D imaging are giving us a whole new window into the world of the Neanderthals. Much of that research over the past 50 years has been supported by funding from the Leakey Foundation. Our guest today is archaeologist and author Rebecca Rag Sykes. Her new book, Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death, and Art, synthesizes more than a century of research on Neanderthals, from the first Neanderthal fossil discovered to the most up-to-date and cutting-edge research, revealing a vivid portrait of one of our most intriguing and misunderstood relatives. We connected over Zoom to chat about her book. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. So in your book, you use an astounding amount of research on Neanderthals in a way that brings them to life for the reader. You've clearly spent a lot of time thinking about Neanderthals. Yeah, maybe I'm a bit obsessed. (laughs) It's a great privilege to be able to do this work professionally as an archaeologist and my PhD was on British Neanderthal record which compared to the continental record is pretty tiny but there's still nothing like actually being able to hold objects from 50, 60,000 years ago in your hands so that was a kind of a wonderful introduction to Neanderthals but then after my postdoc in France I realised that there was this other thing in me urging to come out, which was to write about and to share all the knowledge that we have as archaeologists that just doesn't really get out there. That's what I wanted to do with this book is to really communicate to people just the jaw-dropping amount of stuff we can know about Neanderthals even from so long ago and with such tiny vestiges of preserved remains most of the time. It is really astonishing. So The archaeology of Neanderthals goes back a long way. The first human fossil ever known to science was a Neanderthal. So that's a lot of research to bring together to tell a story about Neanderthals. Could we start by talking about the big picture of Neanderthals? Yeah, I think in terms of really imagining Neanderthals and positioning where they sit in the grand scheme of human origins and and our deep history, When they were first discovered in um, 1856, or first recognised at least, because there were earlier fossils and found, but they weren't really understood, there were already debates quite early as to, was this some kind of missing link between us and the, you know, other ape species? And although there was a lot of debate at the time, it was recognised by biologists, including Thomas Huxley, that no way is this some kind of midway creature this was very close to humans yes of course there are anatomical differences but you know it's not halfway between us and a chimpanzee which was what was being um, compared in those early publications and yet I think people wanted to place them in that zone of not really a human in terms of living complex hunter-gatherer type life ways I think they were always being pushed into a much more bestial role until well into the first decades of the 20th century even then there were definitely dissenting voices but I think what really started to change in how we understand the way that Neanderthals actually lived was when the attention started shifting away from their bodies towards the things that they made And to be fair, it wasn't until probably four decades after they were initially found that people even realised 
that there were stone tools associated with them. So they had the skeletons for a long time. And then they had other sites where there were the stone tools, what we call lithics, with no fossils. And it took all that time to the 1890s until the Neanderthal remains were found in association with stone tools. And at that point, suddenly they had a culture. But it still took a while, I think, for people to start to really dig in to the subtlety of what they're up to without using them as a foil for us to just regard them on their own terms and I think that has been one of the biggest changes in the past probably 30-40 years is people have started to ignore the extinction question and just say okay Neanderthals yes they disappeared from the fossil record 40,000 years ago okay that is one thing but what about the previous 300,000 years? And there is so much there. And people started to move away from these ideas that Neanderthals just did the same old thing for the entire time they were around and they didn't innovate, that they were just somehow static. They just hung around and waited to die, you know, <laughs> waited for us to turn up and, and go. And that has really been changing the past few decades. Is there anything um, specific you can point to that's especially contributed to this change in understanding over the past few decades? It's gone hand in hand with, with the way that archaeology as a discipline has also matured and understood the level of detail that you can actually get from an assemblage of pieces of stone that were napped, essentially, depending on how you look at them and the way that you consider them in totality and as individual objects and the revolution in archaeological science, we can look at the life story of one particular object. What was, how was that napped? Where did that stone come from? Where does that fit in the landscape? Are there any, what we call use wear polishes that can show us what that one piece was actually used for, but then take a bigger view, look at a bigger scale and fit that object within the other wider context of the assemblage that it's from and how does that all fit together and it's that level of I guess different scales of analysis now that I think people would be surprised at the range of things that we can do and that's just stone that's not even talking about bone or all the other different things the different materials that we can actually access now using 21st century archaeology. Rebecca says this new knowledge about stone tools and assemblages of artifacts tells us a lot about how Neanderthals made a living and about their relationship to the world around them. She says the evidence shows that Neanderthals were living true hunter-gatherer lifestyles. They were top hunters in their environment, that's abundantly clear, um, yet they were not stuck in some kind of big game rut they were able to assess what was in the environment they were in, whichever kind of environment it was, whether it was cool, steppe, tundra, or warm Mediterranean forest. And if that means in one area you've got reindeer and mammoth and in another area you've got red deer and boar, they were able to adapt to that. And as well, even smaller game, we can see rabbits and birds, and seafood, so the notion that they were some kind of beta version of hunter-gatherers just doesn't really hold up. Um, so I think that's one thing that really modern archaeologists understand that Neanderthals were following their own pathway. They, they're not on our lineage, although there is interbreeding. They're on their own pathway, but it is the pathway of a sophisticated hunting and gathering evolutionary niche, definitely. And we should expect that because if you look at the long-term context of where Neanderthals fit in human evolution, they are remarkably close to us chronologically. If you go all the way back to the first stone tool technologies, we now know that is 3.3 million years ago. That's hugely distant. Neanderthals don't emerge as a distinctive lineage until 
400,000 years ago. We start, we can see them in genetic terms and anatomically. That's less than half a million years ago. It's, it's so close in time to us. So we should expect that the kind of hunting and gathering life way that we see emerging already in African Homo agaster populations well over a million years ago, that we should expect that to have been refined over time and that they should be demonstrating quite sophisticated ways of living. And that is totally what we see. This kind of sophistication shows in their stone tools and also, remarkably, in the way they worked wood to make things like spears. Certainly in some times and places, they were making wooden spears. And the oldest ones that we have are 330,000 years old. And they're from a German site, uh, Schöningen. And they are beautiful objects. They are extremely finely carved. They appear to be intended for throwing because they look like they are weighted, just like javelins are at the front. And that's been known for a little while, but modern analysis looking back at, at this material again and the recent publication of a large amount of research on that site, that's found that they are they're targeting the quality of things. So they're going after uh, the base of the branches and the trunks for the tips of the spears, which makes sense because it's the most robust wood. And we can even see that they're offsetting the way that the spears are carved, you know, from Spain and Italy, we believe they're digging sticks. And in that case, they're using very similar woodworking techniques. They're offsetting it again, but also they are choosing a different wood, the hardest wood available in that environment, which was boxwood, which makes complete sense because if you've got a digging stick, you're just bashing it all the time and you want it to, to last and to, to be robust. And yes, okay, people... They might, they might think, oh, spears, they're, they're a bit more sexy, a bit more interesting than a digging stick. But a digging stick is perhaps the thing that's going to get you dinner on the day that you miss your quarry <laughs> hunting. So you have to put as much care into these objects. And that is exactly what we see. There's also a lot of new research on what the Neanderthals were finding and choosing to eat when they used their digging sticks and hunting spears. Depending on what environment they're in, they're always going to have different options. But it looks very much as if they are able to select the best of what's there in terms of the species that make most sense. But also when they've actually got the animal, they focus right in on the richest parts of the body, not just the meat. But for hunters and gatherers, you've got to have the fat and the offal with all of these other nutrients, micronutrients that your body really needs. And they, that's what they focus on. That's what they transport away from the kill sites, from the, from the carcass processing sites. And this also echoes hunter-gatherers. We don't see some kind of scrum at the carcass, like with wolves and hyenas, and you're lucky if you get a scrap. It, this, it's so much more systematic. Those animals are taken apart and then they're moved elsewhere to people waiting to have food provisioned to them. So what comes out of that is that resources are shared, at least for some members within that group. And that is the fundamental basis of how hunting and gathering societies work. Yes, there are some levels of social hierarchy, but it is actually much more about sharing of resources than, than not, and that is certainly the impression that we get from the Neanderthal record as well. When there's so much research, it can get complicated because you're trying to reconstruct the lives of ancient people who lived through hundreds of thousands of years of time and across a great expanse of the world. And you're trying to do that using flakes of stone and pieces of bone and other artifacts that only capture one small frozen moment in time. To get a holistic picture, to really tell their story, you need a way to connect all the different realms of Neanderthal lives and their world. In her book, Rebecca says there's one thing that brings it all together, 
And it's the same thing that human lives have historically centered around. The hearth fire. She says Neanderthals and archaeologists alike can begin there at the center and spiral outward. I find this idea fascinating, and I loved the way Rebecca wrote about hearths in her book. I asked her to read a short passage from her chapter about hearths. Hearths are archaeological touchstones. They lie at the center where the warp of time and weft of space connect. Like beacons shining through the fog of millennia and confusing haze of data, they offer anchor points precisely because they were also the cause for Neanderthal life. Claims that Neanderthal use of space was thoughtless or random, equal to that of hyenas, are now truly obsolete. On the contrary, they were among the first hominins to create complex, intentional divisions of space, with a surprisingly familiar layout. Hearths are the stable cores around which both Neanderthals and archaeologists gravitate. They ignite our collective imaginations, summoning and illuminating the shadowy wraiths around them. Fires are time-travelling artefacts. A light, they stretched through days or even weeks. Cold and buried, they're memorials for vanished bodies moving around them. Thank you so much for reading that. So can you tell me why hearths and the things, the traces they left behind are such an important gateway into the lives of Neanderthals? I think the hearths are so important because, I mean, everybody says, oh, home is where the hearth is and all that. And it is true. I'm not the first to say that by any stretch, but I think because archaeologists at least have known for a while that Neanderthals did use fire and we found hearts. It is taken for granted somewhat and I think the public might know all oh, Neanderthals could, could make fire but you know what does it actually mean for their lives and I wanted to really delve deep into that because for two reasons because it does illuminate many aspects of the way that they organize themselves and it's also great because the stuff we can do with hearths now is just bonkers. I think many decades ago, if people found a hearth, they would just write in their field notebooks, 1930s, oh, I found a hearth, lots of ash, and that's it. And so because there was no real proof, as people rightly, much later in archaeology, became a little bit sceptical about some of the earlier excavations and the claims that had been made, people started to, to discount that and be like, well, well, we don't know if they really found that. Was it just a, a grey layer of sediment? Was there really a hearth? And it took a while, I think, for Neanderthal pyrotechnology to be a bit re rehabilitated. But once that happened, and once we also get past the fact that they don't really go in for sort of stone-encircled campfires in that sort of clichéd view of what does a fire a campfire look like they don't really do that but that doesn't mean that their control of fire is less sophisticated and as archaeology has become aware that we have to basically dig everything more slowly and assume that the layers you're dealing with are much finer than you may be able to initially see with your eye that's been perfect for really beginning to understand what we can get out of excavating hearths and so rather than just digging it through now if people encounter a hearth there is there's much more careful attention to the micro layers within a hearth and people through not only excavation but also experimental work has been incredibly important in how we understand this aspect of Neanderthal life. Experimental archaeological research done by Leakey Foundation grantee Carolina Malal and her Neanderthal Fire Project has helped identify the signature traces of activity around the fire. Their research shows that things like cooking meat on coals, putting out a fire with water, or sweeping and trampling fresh ash leaves identifiable markers in the sedimentary record. It's changed our understanding of 
what are the different layers and what information can we get out of them? So once you know that the black layer is the base or ground surface upon which that fire was built, you can then say, well, that material is all older than the fire. And so we concentrate on the ash instead and say, okay, what kind of stuff are they burning? And then you can do really exciting stuff where you take sediment samples through the hearth, we call them thin sections, look at them under a microscope, and then you can actually see different periods of use of that single fire. So you can tell has that fire been raked out? Have they been actually maintaining that hearth by getting rid of the old ash? And if you are also doing, if you're also doing thin section analysis in other parts of your site, you can then identify the ash dumps where they're putting this waste, and you know that they are actually spatially organising the entire site. That they're just not just throwing junk around. They are they are creating middens, rubbish heaps. You can then, in the hearth, if you go back to the hearth again, you can say, okay, well, can we see evidence for different temperatures of burning in this one hearth? And you can find some evidence for that in that sometimes you can find micro splinters of bone in these thin sections, you can see them, they're tiny, and they have, bone will change color depending on the temperature it's burnt at. And so depending on the different colors of bones, you can see during different phases of that single hearth that it burned at different temperatures. So you start to get this sort of understanding of the control of fire and the different uses of hearth. So you can see that a particular fire at a particular moment in time was maybe a low fire that they banked at night to keep them warm and safe while they slept around it. That's a different archaeological signature than a bigger, hotter fire, which might suggest a cooking fire. We don't always know what they're doing with those hearths, but we get hints because from the sediments around the hearth, you can then take more thin sections or chemical analysis because we can also do like pinpoint chemical analysis on these uh, sediment samples. And you can say, OK, well, it looks like there may have been some fat sort of deposits burning here, animal fats. So perhaps this is a cooking hearth or this is some other kind of processing um, going on. So once you start to take that level of analysis and apply it through that site, you can see basically patterns of choice in terms of how Neanderthals are creating the fires, placing the fires, fueling the fires and maintaining the fires by cleaning them out. So all of those things together start to mesh to give you like a vision of people living in that site in a very particular way. And if you then compare that across regions or different periods, you might see that there's different focuses on different wood species, for example. That can give you a sense of how Neanderthals were moving across the landscape and using natural resources. For example, Rebecca says, a lot of the time, Neanderthals seem to be burning pine, which makes sense because during colder periods in the north, pine made up a majority of the wood. In the south, in the Mediterranean, sometimes we see something else going on. They're, having, they're using different tree species. It's difficult to know if that's intentional or if it's just what, what was around them. But in some cases, there may have been preferences because I'm sure if they knew the properties of different woods, for making objects, then they would have been paying attention to how those woods burned as well. So it shouldn't surprise us that they may have had an interest in the, the quality of different fuels. And amazingly, we can also see in one site, only one, that they were burning brown coal from a natural deposit that was found um, in the river valley not far away. But that's not accidental. That is Neanderthals probably just encountering lumps of this eroding out on the edges of the river, looking at it, feeling it, thinking, what is this? What can I do with that substance? And um, presumably bringing it back and burning it, or even perhaps burning it by the side of the river and realizing it's a fuel. And then it's brought back and used. And what's very interesting is that this one site, Le Canalette in France, why did they choose that? Is it because there were no trees? Well, in fact, 
the environmental evidence doesn't support that because they are using this brown coal even during the warmer periods of occupation at that site. So it's not because there's no wood. It may well be that this group or this, this population that occupied this region twigged that brown coal is actually pretty good for burning your fire. And, and if you add it to a fire largely fueled by wood, it prolongs the life of that fire substantially. It just you know gives you a better fire that burns more evenly and stuff. Um, you can get higher temperature as well, but it does look as if there is a genuine sort of interest in that material and a continuing interest. We don't know if that was a tradition that was maintained because we'd be looking at at least centuries, if not millennia. And that's hard to argue if that really was a maintained tradition. But even if it wasn't, it suggests that whenever the Neanderthals occupied that area, even if it was new groups, they still had that same reaction to discovering this substance and the properties that it had and understanding the benefit that it could give them in terms of, of how they manage fire. So there's, and there's so many different examples like that, not just from how they use fire, but all the other realms of, of the way that they interact with materials and work that into their lives. We see that all over the place. So, so if we shift our focus from the materials and try to imagine the people that were making and using them, If you imagine the Neanderthals sitting around the fire, what was their society like? Is there a way to to know how many Neanderthals would have been gathered around a hearth? Yeah, so this is one of the hardest things to access about Neanderthals, and people want to know it because it's a very basic thing to imagine about them. Like, what did their groups look like? How many of them were there in a group? And there's different ways of trying to access that. Um, First of all, If we look at hunting and gathering populations through from recent cultures, through historical, they almost never live in large numbers, in in large densities. Typically, your average group that's active during the day together is 20 people, 25 people-ish, less. And also, they're fluid A group of people who may be living together hunting in the summer may very well not be the same people who are doing things together in the winter. So there is fluidity in hunter-gathering cultures all over the place. So in that basis, we would never expect Neanderthals to be living in villages, really, in terms of the, the kind of environments that they had to support them. And so we would always expect the numbers to be relatively small. But you know, the what it comes down to basically is if you are digging a site and you have a large area, say, I don't know, 60, 70 meter square surface, and you have 60 hearths visible on that surface you've just excavated, what are the relationship of those to each other? And that's one of the hardest things that we've been struggling with for a long time. The number of hearth fires and their relationship to each other in a site can give researchers an idea of how their societies may have been organized. When there's evidence of multiple hearths in different areas or in different stratigraphic layers, so in different periods of time, researchers can find clues to how the hearths and the spaces around them were used by meticulously excavating and plotting in 3D where every single thing was found and by analyzing the stone tools and stone flakes and bits of bone that center around each hearth of the site. Looking for connections that might show how people were moving between hearths, how many times they occupied the site, and how many Neanderthals may have been using the space. The site with 60 hearths, Rebecca mentioned, is a famous site in Spain called Abric Romani. It's a large rock shelter discovered in 1909. Archaeologists have found fossilized remains of Neanderthals there and animals and thousands of artifacts. With that many hearths and bones and tools, you can imagine it as a bustling home base for groups of Neanderthals. Other sites are smaller with just a single hearth and maybe a scattering of tools and bones from maybe an ibex or a tortoise that was brought there. 
giving the impression of a place where just a few people were hanging out for a short period of time before moving on. In the larger sites like Abrik Romani, there were more people there. They appeared to be sharing sometimes the carcasses of larger animals like horses and woolly rhino. That's being apparently distributed across the site in some way versus these much smaller, more ephemeral places like Abrik del Pastor, where potentially we're looking at little splits off from a main group who've gone off to do something else, perhaps that's seasonal, perhaps they split up and they just live separately seasonally, maybe four, maybe two of them, I don't know. There are comparisons for that in hunting and gathering ethnography. Sometimes very tiny family groups will go off for the summer and hunt and that's just them doing their thing all summer. Or it might be a hunting group that is off for a few days and then they're going back to a larger group. So we don't know what was going on for each layer at Abrik del Pastor, but it tells us that there is diversity in the organization of the groups. So it wasn't that long ago that our, that our Homo sapiens ancestors shared the world with these groups of Neanderthals, and they even had babies together. So what, if anything, can the story of Neanderthals tell us about ourselves? Yeah, um, I, I avoided talking about us as much as possible in the book because I wanted it to be Neanderthals on their own terms. But at the end, I do bring us in a little bit more because, yeah, it's it's inescapable that there are, there's nobody around today that really looks like a Neanderthal, although people like to make jokes about their neighbour and whatever. But there is nobody that really looks like a Neanderthal anymore. And yes, there was interbreeding. And we now know that the period of time over which that interbreeding happened was massively longer than we used to believe. It, it did not all happen 40,000 years ago, right at the end. We can see multiple phases going back before 200,000 years now, we believe. So there was always some level of interaction and connection, but perhaps not consistently present. And it was never enough for either us or Neanderthals to lose our physical distinctiveness. They carried on looking like them till 40,000 years ago, and so did we. We carried on looking like Homo sapiens. And yet there had to have been some kind of basic compatibility for children to thrive enough, at least the, the case which has left a legacy in living people, for them to have their own children and their children have children otherwise we wouldn't see that in us today so there is there's an interesting tension there and of course the whole well why did they disappear and what does it mean I think it's one of the hardest questions because as with a lot about Neanderthals the answer has got more complicated it, there is no clear sort of environmental or or climatic context that screams something terrible. They had lived through cold periods, colder than it was 40,000 years ago. The climate was deteriorating again, but it wasn't extreme. And it was actually, it was quite unstable. But again, they had coped with quite fluctuating circumstances before. So in that sense, it was nothing new. And we also now know that the Homo sapiens had been in Eurasia for a long time. It's not like there was a new sudden influx of a different hominin, because not only had we been dispersing from Africa at least 180,000 years ago, we're into China, 80,000, Australia, 65,000 years ago. But we also know Neanderthals were living alongside other closely related groups, one of which we know is as the Denisovans, were identified initially genetically from this site in uh, Siberia, Denisova Cave. So Neanderthals had not been alone and then suddenly surprised by these other populations. So that implies something had to be different. That makes sense. So do you have any idea what changed? Like what could have been different? In that final sort of period between about 55,000 and 40,000 years ago, when we believe there was a late dispersal of Homo sapiens 
out when that final interbreeding took place in more than one context where there has to have been multiple periods even within that time span. And we know that because there is an early Homo sapiens fossil from Siberia which has Neanderthal DNA in their ancestry thousands of years before they lived, implying it was about 55,000 years ago. But then there's a much later fossil from Romania with incredible Neanderthal ancestry, 11%, I think it is, which implies that this individual who was living about 40,000 years ago, very close to the end of the Neanderthals, had a Neanderthal ancestor within two to four generations. You know, that's the span of time between us right now and the Victorians first finding the Neanderthals. It's very recent. So that's at least two periods of interbreeding during this final phase. So there was contact, there was there were babies being born, but by 40,000 years ago, everything we see in terms of fossils and the cultures that we associate with Neanderthals is gone. So that we wouldn't expect that basically it's an unexpected thing if you look at the, the entirety of the record before that so something is different it could be that there is a drastic difference in hunting efficiency perhaps it, there are theories that this later dispersal of former sapiens populations may have had bow and arrow technology but equally they seem to be eating mostly the same stuff that doesn't really make sense you don't see a real difference before 40,000 years ago in, in what they're doing but the genetics does have an interesting hint in that some of these early fossils that I've talked about with the hints of the Neanderthal interbreeding we can also look at their DNA to get an impression of the size of the breeding populations they came from basically how connected their populations were compared to Neanderthals and both Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens, they're all tiny numbers overall in terms of who's there in the landscape. But we get the distinct impression that Neanderthals were living generally in more isolated populations compared to the Homo sapiens group. So there seems to be a difference there in terms of social connectivity. Something is different. So are you saying that Homo sapiens have having closer ties and less isolated groups may have been a factor is there a way to know how that's represented archaeologically is tricky it may be that we start to see more clearly there is more evidence um, for objects that we would call symbolic or socially meaningful in terms of perhaps pendant things with holes drilled through them and things they start to get a lot more common from about forty-five thousand years ago in these very early Homo sapiens population. So perhaps that is a material representation of something social that's different. But what it says about us, I mean, we focus on on our success that oh, we're still here and all oh, these this final dispersal happened and then the Neanderthals were pushed out and all that. But what about all those ones for tens of millennia beforehand who did not displace the Neanderthals, who in genetic terms are more extinct than the Neanderthals because we can't see any gen, any heritage in anybody living today from those earlier Homo sapiens groups that went out into Eurasia. So I think we are projecting a lot <laughs> onto this final phase of existence. And I think the other important thing to remember is that I have said, oh, the Neanderthals a lot, but the span of time they lived through and across in terms of geographic range, they're going from the British Isles through to Central Asia, through to Siberia. It's enormous that the end is going to be different in different parts of that world. It's not going to look the same. The mechanisms will be different. The kinds of contact that they had or not is going to be different. So there is never going to be one answer that will tell us something neat about ourselves, I don't think. So one last question before we go. What do you hope people will take away from reading your book? Yeah, I think I think I would like people to see the Neanderthals on their own terms, to forget about what happened 40,000 years ago or, or not, and just look at what they did, what they achieved, and the familiarity of their lives 
and of course they're not the same as us but I think people would I think people I hope people will come away from this book feeling a connection to this incredibly ancient past and there's complexity about who one calls one's ancestors and yes technically most living people have Neanderthal ancestry and in fact potentially all living people do because for sub-Saharan African populations there may have been some Neanderthal input through connections with later Homo sapiens but there is something there but in terms of Neanderthals simply being people other kinds of humans who went before and who we interacted with who we made babies with who yeah I think I would like people to feel a or to at least find some kind of connection in this book albeit with a past that might seem very alien initially um, but when you really delve down into the archaeology there is a lot that suddenly starts to appear familiar You can find Rebecca Ragsyke's book, Kindred, at your local bookstore or library. There's a link in your show notes to the book and to her website, as well as a link to the bibliography for the book, which is a massive Google Doc with 61 pages of research papers about Neanderthals. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding human origins research and sharing discoveries. You can support this show and the science we talk about by making a donation to the Leakey Foundation today. For the month of February, we're running a campaign in celebration of Charles Darwin's birthday. 100% of the money we raise will go towards funding research grants. All donations up to $2,500 will be matched by Leakey Foundation trustee Mike Smith and matched again by the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation. And as part of our Darwin celebration, we're having a big event on Saturday, February 13th. It's called A Most Interesting Problem. And it's about what Darwin got right and wrong about human evolution, 150 years after the publication of his book, The Descent of Man. We have an all-star lineup of speakers, Jeremy De Silva, Darwin historian Janet Brown, Brian Hare, Johannes Haile Selassie, Augustin Fuentes, Holly Dunsworth, and Anne Gibbons. It's free, so don't miss it. Visit bit.ly slash origins Darwin to get your free tickets. The link is in your show notes. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Theme music by Henry Nagel and additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. As always, thanks for listening.